Our church is a lot larger than these walls. Isn't that good to know? Amen. Sometimes we don't always get to talk about a lot of the things that, that happen and take place, but there's a lot of good things that are happening. Would you just stand up for a moment? Turn around three times and then be seated. I just want your blood to circulate for a wee bit. Amen. If you have your Bible, will you turn with me to the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 10, and I'll be reading from verse 22. I'll lead in a little bit as well, because here Paul is sharing about uh, the new faith that the people here were walking in, and they were experiencing the anointing and the, and the power of the Lord. Uh, one of the things that God has always placed in my heart, my, my primary ministry falls into three categories, edification, exhortation, comfort. That, that's just who I am. I'm what you call one of those load and fire preachers. I load up and I fire it out. I, I just put it right out there and allow the Holy Spirit to take whatever is said and to apply that to each and every heart because we are, we are all so unique and we are all so different. But tonight I want to bring you some words of exhortation, but also some words that also fall into that place of warning as well. Because when we're exhorting, you know, we're putting forth that Word of God. Uh, we're giving you direction. We're giving you instruction. Because even as we heard this morning, God's ultimate purpose in our life is to bless each and every one of us so that we will worship and magnify Him, so that we will have an incredible experience with our God. Every single day of our lives, should be a love face with Jesus. I mean, every single day. There should not be a day goes by when we're not thinking about our Lord, when we're not honoring our Savior, where we are not realizing the great salvation in which we enjoy. Thank God we're going to heaven. Amen? Now, I know you just don't want to go tonight, but the fact is we're going to go to heaven. Amen? And uh, there's a great and a wonderful future for each and every one of us. But here as Paul is uh, making this plea uh, to those uh, in the Hebrew uh, church there so that they will keep that new faith, so that they will go forward, so that they will enhance the relationship that they have with him. And he says here in verse 19, as I just lead this down, having therefore, brethren, boldness, to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Now, we need to pause there just for a moment. The honor and the privilege and the access that we have to heaven is incredible. And yet we overlook it many times. We don't realize it, that you can call on the Lord at any given moment. You can have a magnificent experience with Him. You can literally feel heaven touching you you touching heaven. We sang about it this morning. There's something wonderful when we come into the presence of the Almighty God by a new and living way, which He hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, His flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God. Now, notice what it says here in verse 2. Let us draw near now, notice what it says here. Let us draw near. Let us draw near. I want you to get this into your spirit. Let us draw near with a true heart. With a true heart. With a heart that is right before God. A heart that is desirous of the things of God. A heart that is bare before Him that we have no ulterior motives other than we want to be in His presence. We want to hear from heaven. We want that anointing and that power to penetrate our very lives, to penetrate our city, to penetrate our nation. Hallelujah. 
God has made all of that possible, but he wants you and I to come before him and to realize that we have that access, that we can come into the very presence of God. And no matter where we find ourselves, God is there. God is so wonderful. Amen? Draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. When it talks about us being washed, it's literally describing us being in the Word of God because it's that Word of God that cleanses us and keeps us and builds our faith and strengthens us. And even as we come together as the body of Christ, when we hear the songs that are sung, the testimonies that are shared, it is so encouraging to help us to move forward in the things of the Lord. And then it says here, let us hold fast the profession or the confession of our faith without wavering. If there was ever a time when we see people wavering, it's today. They're in and out. They're up and down. They don't know what they believe any longer. But here the Scripture is very clear. Hold fast to that which you have, that profession, that moment when you accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior. Never let go of that. It doesn't matter what blessing comes. It doesn't matter what the enemy tries to do. You hold on to that faith. Let nothing deter it. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. You hold on to what God has done in your life, and you rejoice in that, and you revel in it, and you rejoice in it, and you share it, and you give it away. Hallelujah. Because it's a living faith. It's not something that is dead. Jesus is alive. He is the resurrection and the life. Hallelujah. And that life is inside each and every one of us because it says he is faithful that promised. You see, some of you have prayed prayers many years ago, and you're still waiting on the answer, but it's coming. He's faithful that promised. If God promised it to you, he's going to bring it about. And what I've discovered about God is the God in whom we serve, his timing is paramount. He doesn't miss the mark, not by one second, hallelujah. He's never late. God is always on time. You can trust him. You can really trust the Lord. But we're to draw near to our God. We're we're to draw closer to him in these days in which we live. If we want to see that anointing and that glory and that power of God manifest, that it comes by our relationship with him. And you and I being those conduits and vessels that he has anointed. You see, in Matthew 5, verse 8, the Beatitude, it says, Blessed are are the pure in heart. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Those that are sincere in heart. It's not talking about people that are perfect and sinless, but those that have got a sincere heart towards God and the things of God, a desire for Him and His will to be accomplished within our very lives. A sincere heart. A heart that's filled with God. Hallelujah. That's why also in In Matthew chapter 22 and verse 37, it says, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all of thine heart. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all of your heart. Wow, not just a part of it, but we give our complete selves to the things of the Lord. Why? Because Psalmist says in Psalm 44, 21, He knoweth the secrets of the heart. See, God knows the real you, the real I. He knows when we're real, and he knows when we're phony. But he's looking for the real you and I with our heart that is yielded towards him. Even though sometimes we may or may not understand all of his purposes, our heart is surrendered towards him. It says we'll see God. We'll see him move in our lives. We'll see him move in our community. We'll see him move in our families if we're really sincere. 
too often our prayers are flippant and, you know, we're not really that serious about some of the things that we pray. We sometimes use God as a fending machine. But you see, when you get serious with God, when you get serious about your family, when you get serious about your community, when you get serious about this election that's coming up, and you really start to pray, God will move. But if you're not serious, then God won't be serious. Because God says, what do you want me to do? That's the kind of God in, in whom we serve. You see, when the Bible talks about the heart of man and the heart of woman, it stands for the entire mental and moral activity, both rational and emotional the emotional elements within our life, our whole being is taken up with our heart, and if our heart is in God, then our heart will be everywhere else as well, because we'll have the heart of God, and God's heart is for everybody in every situation, hallelujah. But he's looking for man and woman, young people to stand in the gap, to do his bidding, hey man. I don't know many times we've preached it from this pulpit. Every single one of you is called of God. But we need to have hearts towards the Lord. You see, we've got to be so careful because the Bible warns us about a time and an age where man's hearts will fail them and, and man will not be as sincere as what they used to be. And we don't want to go down that path. We want to be those that are on that front line saying, God, you've got all of me. I think the songwriter had it so well when he says, I surrender all. He didn't say, I surrender a part of me, but I surrender all. We give ourselves to, to the Lord. Hallelujah. See, our heart must be in it. You see, the other thing that we learn when we interact and when we deal with others and and why God is telling us to access him and to receive that anointing is, is so that by the very fruits of our lives, others will see that Christ is in us. You see, we must remember that people will judge you by your actions, not your intentions. You may have good intentions, but it never achieves anything. You understand what I'm saying? It's by your actions. What are you doing? And it's obvious tonight that you're in church when others aren't. Your heart is here. Their heart is somewhere else. But they're Christians. Come on now. You know what I'm saying. You see, it's hard for God to use us if we're just full of intentions but not action. You see, you might have a heart of gold, but so does a hard-boiled egg. What are you doing? We need to put one foot in front of the other. We need to be man and woman of prayer. We need to be man and woman that are, are seeking the will and direction of God in our life and giving ourselves to Him. There's one thing that doctors and surgeons tells us that the, the hardening of the heart ages people more quickly than the hardening of the arteries. So many people, their hearts are hard and not soft towards the things of God, not tender toward hearing the voice of the Lord. But you know what I've also discovered? The heart is happiest when it beats for others. Beats for others. I always remember, again, words of a, an old, old song. Wait a little longer, please, Jesus. There's still so many wandering out in sin. My heart, in one sense, longs for his return, and yet the other part of me says, Oh, Lord, there's still so many that have grown cold and they're not serving the Lord. 
They're not holding fast their profession of faith. They're not enduring. They're not persistent. They're not staying the course. See, the course isn't easy. We realize that. It takes discipline, integrity, giving God time when time is off the essence, but yet you will discover that when you put God first, you will be amazed at the time that God will give to you to do the other things. Bless you. And God wants you to endure in every area of your life. He wants you to be persistent in your faith as you serve the Lord, and he wants you to stay the course. In Hebrews 4, verse 14, if you will turn there with me for a moment. Verse 14. Seeing then we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. He was enduring. He was persistent. He stayed the course, hallelujah. And he's interceding for you and I every single day, praise God. And then we are so encouraged, verse 16, let us therefore come what? boldly onto the throne of grace, that we might obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. It's good to have your relationship intact with God so that at any moment you can just go before him and you just know that you know that God is going to take care of you. Hallelujah. See, friends, the church must come back to realize again What is the profession of our faith? What is our confession? It is this, that Jesus is our Savior. He's our healer. He's our baptizer. He is our soon coming King. And Jesus is our Lord. Hallelujah. Those things you cannot compromise on. Doesn't matter what our governments try to do or what others say. Kingdoms rise and fall. But God's kingdom lasts for eternity. Hallelujah. Oh, there may be the odd, the odd little battle here and there, but we win the war. Amen? Hallelujah. We win, we win the war. Praise God. Oh, turn with me to another uh, great scripture here. I want to give you... First Timothy 6. Verse 11. Again, as Paul is encouraging young Timothy here to stay the course, I believe God saying to each and every one of us tonight, but thou, O man of God, woman of God, flee those things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. What incredible instruction. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. Whereunto thou art also called and, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. Friends, as you live your daily life, live it in such a way where you will reflect the image of a marvelous Savior in all that you say, and all that you do, and how you conduct yourselves. Because others are watching. Others are watching. He goes on here to say, verse 13, I give thee charge in the sight of God, who quickeneth all things, and before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate, witness a good confession. Hallelujah. He didn't compromise. One of the saddest things today is the church is compromised, and that's why we're in the mess that we're in today. That thou keep this commandment without spot 
unrebukable until the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Again, we're encouraged. Fight that good fight of faith. Stand for those things which are proper and true and righteous. Hallelujah. I mean, friends, he is our king of kings. And he is our Lord of lords. As we go back again to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23. You see, we are encouraged to build each other up and let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And then verse 24, and let us consider one another to provoke. But the problem is in the church, we don't use the right kind of provoking. We agitate. We gossip. (laughs) We stir up. But you see, what it's talking about here in verse 24, we are to stir up onto love and to good works. That's what we're supposed to be doing. And that's what we want to do from this pulpit week in and week out, is we want you to go further, and we want you to go deeper into the things of God than you've ever done before. In that relationship, we want your heart to be bare before Him, so that that relationship is wholesome and healthy and strong. Hallelujah. Consider one another. Provoke me, stir up. You see, the sad thing, it's easy to stir up hate and godless deeds. But it takes a whole lot more to stir us up to love and to good works. But that's what we want to do. Whatever you're doing for the kingdom, keep on doing it. Allow the love of God to flow through your life. That's why Galatians 5, 2, but the fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, joy, peace. Long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. I mean, that is a tremendous list right there as we think about God's goodness and mercy and, and His love flowing through our very being. Amen? When people look at us, do they see God's love? Do they see His joy? Do they see His peace? Do they see the long-suffering, the gentleness, the goodness, the faith? Do they see those in operation or... Or are they seeing something entirely different? There's nothing worse than when a believer loses it. (laughs) No, maintain your faith in God. Stir each other up. Amen. Hebrews 13, verse 20. Try to keep some of these scriptures close here. Verse 21, now the God of peace, you want peace in your life? Open your heart to God. That brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect. That word perfect, of course, you should know is complete. Make you complete, hallelujah. In every good work to do His will, working in you that which is well, pleasing in His sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So even when God is doing amazing and wonderful things through you, even as we heard this morning, God gets all the glory. God gets all the praise because it's Him. Hallelujah. But He gives us His Word and He gives us an example as how we are to conduct ourselves while we live here in this old world. As we go back to Hebrews 10, verse 25, most people have tore this out of their Bible in the 21st century. Because this is crucial, this is very important. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, 
but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. Let me ask you, are we closer to Jesus' return today than we were yesterday? So therefore, we should be together more. Isn't that correct? That's what the Bible says. Not forsaking yourselves together. But somebody came up with a wonderful idea. Let's have family time. Well, what happened to family time in church? Uh, you know my take on this. I've preached on it before. Right now, they're not sitting at home having Bible study. And many of you know that. They're not singing, my hallelujah belongs to you. They're watching the idiot box. You know what the idiot box is, don't you? It's your television. When it should be in the house of God. They're, they're, they're forsaking the assembling of themselves together. So what happens is when a crisis happens or some problem happens, there's no faith in their life because they're empty on the inside. But when you come to the house of God, when we meet together, see, we are the body of Christ. But how can you be a body if our pieces are all over the place? We see it happening all around us. We know the great disservice of what the enemy has done with Sunday now being the busiest shopping day of the year. We're all aware of that. We see that, the consequences of it, and the impact it's having in the lives of families today. It's very destructive. We need to be in the house of the Lord. When you consider the time that you spend in the house of the Lord, you will find it's not even a tenth of your time. We need to be in God's house. Amen? You see, one very important reason just for Christians are to assemble is for reciprocal encouragement, strengthening, and stirring up each other. Hallelujah. It's wonderful when you hear a solo. It's lovely when you hear a du duet. Great when you hear a quartet. But I'm telling you, when you hear a choir come together, when you hear the church come together, when all those voices come together, when that praise goes up, when the instruments start and we start to worship God, it's absolutely wonderful, hallelujah. It's amazing what our God can do. All right, quickly, I'm doing all right here. Colossians 3, verse 12. Talking about Christian virtues. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy, beloved bowels of, of mercy. Talking about being merciful, having tender mercies. That's the way God is towards us, isn't he? He is so merciful. But look what it says here. And, and this is, again, what we need is the body of Christ. Kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, Forbearing one another. That means bearing with one another. And do you know what's so wonderful here? I love this. Forgiving one another. You know, sometimes, and you'll have to agree with me here, sometimes Christians can be the most unforgiving people on the face of the earth. Isn't that the truth? Not sure about that, are you? Shouldn't be that way, but it's true. Sad to say it's true, but the Bible says for you and I, you know, as we encourage each other, as we, as we build up, as we exhort, as we challenge each other, forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgive you, so also do you. You see how simple it is? And if we would use the principles of the Word of God, the enemy would not get the foothold that he has got in so many lives and so many families. It's unbelievable. 
I mean, some marriages break up because the guy leaves the socks on the floor and she leaves the tap of the, the toothpaste not on it. I mean, it's ridiculous, isn't it? There's no tolerance anymore. But yet God is dealing with forgiveness and love and mercy, and yet we want to experience this in our life, and if we want to experience it in our life, we need to bear our hearts before God and make sure that there's nothing hindering us in our relationship with Him or in our relationship, if at all possible, with one another. And above all things, verse 14, put on charity, love, which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts to the which also you are called in one body. And notice what it says here, verse 15. Be ye thankful. Be ye thankful. Amen? Be thankful. Be thankful for what God has already done in your life. And and for those things, as Pastor Brian said, that God didn't allow to come his way. Let the word of Christ. You see, here it is, friends. Here, if you missed anything that I've said here tonight, don't miss this. And we're, we're, nearly, we're nearly through here. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Notice that. Teaching and admonishing one another. How? Psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts. But notice what it says here. Who are we singing to? What's it say there? To the Lord. See, when you come in here, you know one of the things that we notice a lot in the church here, especially Sunday morning, most people come in after the worship's over. Like, I scratch my head to the point I'm still amazed that I'm not bald in one spot. It's like, You're supposed to be in the house of God worshiping, singing, magnifying, praising, glorifying the Lord for bringing you to God's house, for giving you the transportation to come. Hallelujah. The right mind to be here. It's amazing. In verse 17, and especially for those of you that are, are serving in, in whatever capacity within ministry, within or without the church, whatsoever you do, whatever it is you do, word or deed, why are you doing it? What is your purpose? My prayer is it's not so that you'll be seen. My prayer is that it's not that you'll be heard, but that you're doing it in the name of of the Lord Jesus, and that you're giving thanks to God and the Father by Him, that in everything we do, we are doing it as unto the Lord because our heart is bare. Our heart is right before the Lord. You know, we have two wonderful big screens up here. Wouldn't it be awful that while you're sitting in church, whatever was in your head was being shown on that screen. And your name underneath it. Is your heart bare before God? Or are you thinking, I want to get home and hear, see the end of the Super Bowl. Or when's he going to shut up? (laughs) <laughs> your name, your thought. <laughs> but aren't you glad that God is merciful? I, why am I sharing these? Because I believe that God just wants us to be open before him, to be man and woman that have a, a pure heart. And if we've got a pure heart, we will have pure motives. And if we have pure motives, we'll have pure thoughts and we'll have pure desires towards the things of God. You see, the assembling of believers is often an outward indication of the inner condition. 
If we're not coming to church, what's that saying to our neighbor? When people drive by a church here on a Sunday night and and see but a handful of cars, what is that saying to the community? See, we do have a responsibility. Can you imagine if they were driving by here tonight and this place was packed? I remember a few years ago that when we opened, when we were doing our New Year's Eve service, there were so many people here. Others were coming up over the bridge that didn't even attend a church. But because they saw there was something going on here, they wanted in on the action. If we're here, God will bring others here. Amen? We need to be in our place. And and we appreciate, and I know right now I'm speaking to the choir because you're here. But just in case one day you decide to stay at home and watch the idiot box instead of being here, I'm praying that the Holy Spirit will just tap you on the shoulder and say, ha ha, remember that message? Get out the church. Amen. I've said this before, and if a man's faith will not get him to church, it's doubtful if it will get him to heaven. You see, the importance of assembling is both subjective and objective. It benefits the individual with spiritual stability and growth, and it benefits objectively by its positive effect on others. God wants us to be in our place as we serve the Lord and as we follow our wonderful Savior. You see, He's an awesome God. He really is. There's much more that I can share there, but I'll just close with one final, one final verse. And I never forget this. See, a lot of times we think that God's judgment in the Old Testament is worse than God's judgment in the New Testament. Friends, I want to tell you, if people willfully sin and continue to follow down that path, we have a righteous judge. And when he finally judges, it's into a lost eternity forever. Think about that. When God moves his hands of blessing from our life, we lose out so much. God is still a judge. Even though we're under grace, God is still a judge. Never forget that. Because verse 31 says, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. See, people have lost that fear and respect for our God. That's why they're not here. They think, well, we're under grace. It's okay. Yet their hearts aren't right. They're an easy target for the enemy. They can fall into the slippery path so easily. But their faith isn't where it used to be. Their hearts literally become hardened. You see, there's times when I'll maybe be in a shopping mall and Somebody say, Pastor, lovely to see you. I know you haven't seen me in six months. Your church is my church. (laughs) Friends, I want to see you every week in God's house. And the time that I don't see you, I know you're on vacation, and I pray that you're in church somewhere, wherever you're vacating. (laughs) Take it another service somewhere else and get blessed. Never take a vacation from God. I realize if you don't come apart, you come apart. I know we need a break in our lives, but not when it comes to God's house. We have multiple services here that will help you, strengthen you, bless you. And I know that when you stand before God, God will look in your heart and it'll be clear before him because he's interceded. You've listened to that word. You've been in that word. It keeps you pure. It keeps you holy. It keeps you in right standing with the Lord. 
Pray and serve him with all of your heart. Follow him every single day. I exhort you in all of these things that we have shared, and yet I warn you, don't get off the beaten path. Don't go to the right hand nor to the left. Stay on that straight and narrow. Would you bow your heads in prayer with me? My precious one tonight, he loves you. There's so much that God wants to do. And he's looking for men and women and boys and girls that will yield themselves to him and to his purpose. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, today. Funny how songs just seem to come to me tonight. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. Is that your heart? I'd rather have Jesus. I believe that that's your heart tonight as well. In these closing moments, would you just bear your heart before God? This is just between you and God. Just, just open up your heart. Like Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Just, just say, Lord, I, I open up the door of my heart right now. And Lord, I know there's some things in there that, that shouldn't be. And I offer them to you right now. Lord, that unforgiveness, that, that hatred towards somebody else. Father, that not fully surrendering to you and to your purpose. Lord, I, I yield that to you right now. As the psalmist said, search my heart. See if there be any wicked way in me. The Bible also says the heart is deceitful above all things. We need to protect it. That's why we need Jesus in our very lives. Lord, I, I pray for your people right now. Lord, heal the heart. Give us tender hearts, O oh God. Compassionate, loving, kind. Hearts that are surrendered to you, Lord. Not our will, but your will be done. Bless your people tonight, Lord. Meet their need and, and watch over them. And, and Lord, bring their loved ones into the kingdom. Lord, those that are sick in body, that you would just bring healing to them. Those that are recuperating from surgery, oh God, that you would watch over them. Those that are going through cancer treatments, Lord, that you would just be there with them. Father God, minister to them and strengthen them, we pray. Lord, those that have recently, within our congregation, that have lost loved ones, that you would give them the comfort and the strength that is needed in their very lives, we pray. Bless them, Lord. Meet every need, whether it be physical, whether it be spiritual, financial, pour your blessing upon them. Lord, we ask it in your lovely name. Would you stand with us and if we could just close with a, a song tonight. We do invite you afterwards to stay a little bit for fellowship downstairs. Okay. They've got a lovely... So we've been fed spiritually. Now you're going to be fed bodily downstairs. They tell me there's a lot of food down there tonight. So go down and enjoy that. And remember, it's faith gospel fellowship, not faith gospel takeout. Okay? The reason we do it is so we can fellowship with you. And not so that you can eat and run. <laughs> All right? Okay. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin, Jesus is calling. Have you 
Thank you so much for your goodness and for all of your great blessing in our life tonight. Be with your people as they leave. And throughout this week, oh God, let it be a week of great victories, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Join us downstairs for some fellowship. If you need any further help, I will be right here at the front. God bless you.